One of those boomers who elevated freak into a compliment and turned party into a verb. I was more worried about the mindless stunt he pulled in Norton's office because it meant Lenny's manic cycle could be kicking in. The one on mother's chest, noun, the taught me scar, raised striped where a breast had been. This picture was the strikeout king of the league. Uh, people weren't supposed to hit home runs off of him, let alone me. I was not necessarily a long ball hitter. I, I live here in Lincoln right now. I grew up in Nebraska, um, grew up in Nance County, Nebraska. And I say Nance County because my family, um, we, my family were farmers. Uh, we had, uh, and at first we were tenant farmers. My mom and dad did not own our farm, but we moved from farm to farm until uh, when I was 15, they did buy their home place. Um, this was all in Nance County. I graduated from Fullerton High School, went to the University of Nebraska for three years. Um, actually got my degree from Auburn University in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, that was the Vietnam War and my mar I, I was married. So that, that took me down there. And then after that I lived outside of Nebraska for about another eight years and came back in 1982. And I live here in Lincoln, as I said, and I work at Emeritus Insurance Company. As I was gathering together material for this presentation, the poems I was going to read, looking back through my work, I was really amazed by how much Nebraska uh, influenced my poetry, so much of it. I, and I've heard it said that poets are, or any writer, is influenced so much by their childhood, and I have certainly found that to be true in my case. So uh, Nebraska and my experiences here have shown up again and again, even though, of course, other, other places and other topics do come in as well. I have always been in love with words, I think, since I was a little kid. I remember when I was very young, actually when I was able to read, so maybe I was about six or seven years old at that time, and I was reading, we had a Mother Goose book, and I remember feeling very self-conscious about the fact that I was reading this book. I was really too old for that kind of a book. That was for babies, uh, and I was a big girl. And, but still, there was something about those rhymes that were, that was magic and the sounds, sometimes nonsense sounds, that all seem to make some sort of sense. So I guess I'm just going to say, first of all, that Mother Goose had a very profound influence on me and um, on my teachers growing up. Uh, most recently, I guess I would have to say that my husband is the one that got me back involved in writing again. I have always been a writer, I think, in that I was interested in it from very, at a very young age, continued writing through school, through grade school and high school and college. Um, I had about a 20 year hiatus, however, from writing and just got back to it um, about 10 years ago. And the, the reason I'm saying my husband is influential is he had started, um, uh, he took up the guitar and was playing this song all about whiskey and blood on the highway. And he said, this is a wonderful tune, but I just hate the words. You're good with words, why don't you write some new ones? So I took that as a challenge. Um, ended up writing some new words for this, um, this song and just realized again how much fun it was to play with words and got, got back into it again. Then I went back to, the, I went to the library and checked out a book, I think it was called Cottonwood Creek, by three authors, th three Nebraska authors, um, Greg Kuzma, Ted Kuzer, and Bill Clefcorn. And in reading that book, I saw they were writing about things that were important to me, ordinary things that I found value in. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe I can do the same sort of thing. and these ordinary things that I want to write about, other people will find value in them as well. So those 
gentleman, unbeknownst to them probably at the time, uh, influenced me. Also, I would have to say um, Chaparral Poets, which is an organization here in town, um, helped me out early on to get to make connection with some other writers. Nancy McCleary, another poet here in town, has been very influential, has been a mentor to me, has helped me to grow a lot, as has Marge Sizer, another very uh, well-known and respected poet here. So I, all of those individuals have been influential to me. And of course, I, I read all the time. I really like uh, I really like the poets Mary Oliver. I really like Jane Kenyon in particular. Uh, they are separate and, and separately delightful in that in poetry, when I'm writing poetry, I like to write in free verse. I just find that that works the best for me. But in songwriting, rhythm and rhyme are very important. And so in songwriting, I, I get to use those parts of the language that, that, I, that I really love and don't really work for me that well in, in poetry. So that's how they're different. I guess the way that they are same is, is the creative process is the same um, in that it's, it, it can come in a big, wonderful whoosh moment, or you might have to work at it and pound it out. Those first years of my life really were influential. And I, especially like right now, I keep finding myself going back to the past. I write a lot about um, the people I knew on, on the farm, our neighbors, the relationships, the relationships of the people to the land, how it affected them and how it reflected them. Also, the weather, I think, is very important. It is sometimes just an absolute delightful thing. It is sometimes so harsh, um, and that's kind of the way things happen to us in our lives as well. So I think those are, those are themes that I come back uh, constantly towards, the people I knew there. Nature. Um, again and again, sometimes some women's issues lately have been coming into my writing. You know, I guess when I'm writing, I guess honestly I'm not thinking of, of who's going to be reading this or even if anybody would ever want to read this. I guess what I'm writing, I just write. Um, and I, I'm hoping that I find some, some spark there, some human connection, some emotion there. And if I'm successful in writing, then maybe it will connect with someone later on. It just happens so many different ways for me. I think as, as a writer, you, you always need to be open to the inspiration when it comes. But I think you have to count on more, more on inspiration because it's not always going to come. So. I have to work at, first of all, just making myself available, and I do try to devote some time every day to make myself available to write, whether I'm writing something fresh and new, something, something on the spur of the moment, maybe from a prompt which I am trying to get myself to go, uh, to get started from, or if I'm editing something that I've already written. Uh, in those moments when I'm, when I'm writing just fresh like that, Oftentimes I can start with something that is very boring, very dull. I'm just writing along and nothing is happening. And then all of a sudden, as I'm writing along, then something will happen, something comes. So that's wonderful when that happens. And then sometimes it will just be as I'm driving, which is not always a good thing, as I'm walking. There seems to be something about movement maybe that frees the mind up. And also there's something, I think there's something about water because getting into the bathtub helps me to <laughs> become inspired or something. I, I am oftentimes reaching for a pen or a pencil from the bathtub. I would say read, 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 write, write, write. I would say honor your writing. Try to make some time every day for your writing. 
when you when you write, keep it someplace where you'll be able to find it, a notebook, uh, a file folder, whatever works for you. Keep writing even if you think it's just drivel. Write drivel because we've got to get that out of us, I guess, to make room for the good stuff to happen and, and just the constant dedication to the process will help things to come. Many people find a writing group to be very helpful. I have found that personally. I've found that I have been able to write in groups. There, there are several kinds of groups. There are, there are generating groups where you get together and you actually write. I belong to several of those and, and it, it's just amazing. I think there is a particular energy that happens in those groups and people come up with some marvelous writing. Some of, some, some of my best work has come from that. Uh, and there are critique groups which can help too. Um, so find a group, find a support network, make some time in your life for writing and, and do send it out. And when it comes back, if it's rejected, send it out again and keep writing. Writing is, um, is such a joy and lately I have had the most wonderful experience in writing a series of poems. Bill Clefcorn, our state poet, wrote a book called Alvin Turner, Farmer. I read that and I love that book. Uh, as you may recall, it's a story of his grandfather, as to the life of his grandfather as told and envisioned by the poet Bill Clefcorn. Uh, in a series of poems. Well, I asked him if he'd ever thought of writing from Mrs. Turner's point of view. And he encouraged me, maybe that might be something that I wanted to do. I decided I wanted to, and I had been wanting to do that, that's maybe why I, why I asked him. But I wrote a series of poems written from the point of view of a Nebraska farm wife living in the 1940s, 1950s, the wife of a tenant farmer. So this would have been the story of my mother, the neighbor ladies, my aunts, my grandmothers, even the teacher at my country school, most of the women that I knew. Um, and these were strong women. This was before the feminist movement, but they were very strong, good women, and I admired them, and I wanted to write about them. And Writing that, that series of poems was just a wonderful experience. I, 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 it, I felt like magic was happening then, and I do have a manuscript, which I want very much to get published someday. And um, I was so impressed and so excited by that process of writing something from a series. I want to try that again. I want to see how many animal poems I have and figure out which ones I need to write about and I think I, I would like to write um, from the point of view of some historical figures. Um, and there, there are some other poetry projects I have. I want to continue with songwriting. I, I, I probably should say that I could not do this without my husband. I have no musical ability whatsoever, except a, maybe a sense of ry rhythm and rhyme. I write the lyrics. My husband is the musician, and he, he does this, the the music part of it. I do want to continue writing that. That is a writing music that is that is wonderful. I I have a novel that I is complete. It's not good enough. I need to get that better. I want to write another novel. I will also would like to write um, I haven't written many short stories, but I have done a little bit in which I write some story cycles where a major character in one story might be a minor or a secondary character in another. I just think that's interesting and it's something that I, I think I want to give it a, a give a try. Sounds like you'll be busy. I think I will. I think I will. <laughs> Do you want to tell us what you'll be reading from tonight and maybe a little bit about how it came into being? Okay. I will, um, I'll be reading from uh, some poems from that Addie Finch manuscript. I'll also be reading um, a some poems from, I, I guess I'm calling them poems that originated out of, out of my first, the first 18 years out of, of my life. Um, and then I'm going to be reading some nature poems. And, um, 
as, as, as I do the reading, I think I'll speak just briefly about some of the poems, so I, I'm hoping that the story of how they, they came across will, will come across. Well, my name is Robin Thompson, and I am fortunate enough to be the curator of the Heritage Room here. I'd like to welcome you both to the Heritage Room and to the John H. Ames Reading Series. The Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room is a special collection that's dedicated to preserving and promoting works by Nebraska authors. And currently, we're excited to have more than 12,000 volumes in our collection written by more than 3,000 Nebraska authors. And that's growing every day. You all are more than welcome to come visit the room during our regular public service hours to explore. We're open Tuesday through Friday from noon until 3 and Sunday afternoons from 2 to 5. We would also like to thank the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association because we're only able to bring you our special programs like these through an endowment that's been established through their volunteer efforts. And tonight, our reader will be Lucy Adkins. Lucy Adkins is a Nance County native who's worked in a variety of, of fields. She's worked as a teacher, as an emergency room assistant, and currently she works at an insurance company. In addition to poetry, she's known for writing folk songs with the help of her husband, and is a member of the Songwriters Sweatshop here in town. Her poems have appeared in Plain Song Review, Owen Wister Review, and quite recently, the anthology Crazy Woman Creek. Her work is inspired by and reflects the Nebraska experience. She once remarked, I grew up on a farm in Nance County, Nebraska, and feel deeply tied to the land and people who work it. And these are the stories I want to tell. Please help me welcome Lucy Adkins. Thank you, Robin, and thank you, everybody, for coming. It's wonderful to, to look out there and see faces that I know, some that I, that I have not had an opportunity to meet yet, but um, I'm delighted that you're here. I would like to start at the beginning, as far as the beginning was for me, and as I told Robin in our interview a little bit earlier, I think the beginning for me was um, nursery rhymes. And... Uh, so my first, uh, the first poem is going to be in praise of Mother Goose. Maybe we might have forgotten about Mother Goose, but I, I think maybe we shouldn't. In praise of Mother Goose. I learned to read when I was six. My chair pulled to the red enamel stove with its Isinglass eyes. I was a big girl, too old for nursery rhymes, those baby nonsense poems. Still I read and turned the pages and read some more. What could it mean? Sheeps in the meadow, cows in the corn made some sort of sense, and one, two buckled my shoe. But what of a world of women who swept the sky, falling bridges, owls and cats in boats, and the sounds like music, hey diddle diddle, and a hey down, dingle down, dingle down day. There was magic out there. Um, this, I've, I've really divided my poems that I'm going to read tonight in three sections. This is an introductory poem, and I want to read one more introductory poem, and I'm going to read this one for my husband, who is missing the baseball playoffs and, <laughs> tonight. So um, this, this, is a, this is true love. Okay. Uh, this poem is called, My Husband Comes Home for Lunch. And maybe before I start, I should say two things. This was written in the summertime. And secondly, my husband is a musician, a bluegrass musician. He plays the guitar, the banjo, the mandolin, and, and the last couple of years has picked up the fiddle. So that'll be important in this poem. My husband comes home for lunch. My true love comes walking up the path. He's wearing a grin and his Pendleton hat. The hat I said he must buy before we go to the beach, all that white sand and sun. For we are growing older now and think of skin cancer, age spots, subtle little dangers. Here he comes, swinging open the door. He's bringing a story, a joke, ends of paper for his writer wife, 
small things he doesn't think of as gifts, just things to save and remember, things with a lot of good left in them that must be used and shared. I think of Gina from the office, how she met her husband after 20 years of looking. All those stitched on smiles and tight skirts, nights with girlfriends in bars. And when the magic finally happened, wine by the fireside, old music, feet up on the coffee table, they said leukemia in eight months at most. And life is not fair, no. It has never been fair. I am one of the lucky ones, I know. My true love of all these years comes walking up the path home for lunch. He wants a kiss, a sandwich, an Oreo cookie. He wants to walk out to the garden and check the tomatoes. He wants to pick up his new fiddle and play like the cricket in the grass. He wants to fiddle around. <laughs> this next little group of poems, um, and we'll just kind of see how this goes here as far as time is concerned. And Robin, if I'm going on too long, just give me the old high sign and I'll stop. But I'm, I'm shooting for about 40 minutes or so, 40, 45. This next grouping of poems um, comes from the first 18 years of my life when I grew up in Nance County, Nebraska, as I was, as I was introduced. Um, I grew up on a farm, actually several farms. Um, my family um, rented farms. We were tenant farmers until my mom and dad were able to buy the farm um, when I was 15 years old, our home place. There were four girls in our family. My sister Bonnie is here, and I'm glad she's here. So some of this will sound familiar to her. Uh, this first one from that section from the first 18 years of my life actually started before, my, uh, before I was alive, but it comes from those memories. Um, it's, and actually, I wrote this in a writing group. It's called On the Pleasant Valley Road. Uh, there's an inscription, Nance County, 1941 to 45. On the Pleasant Valley Road that rolls from Palmer to Fullerton, all the farmhouses set square to the road, and there are stars in the windows for those at war, blue stars for service, gold for the dead, and above all God's stars shining, their light weak and cold, but shining over those little farms over the farmers and farm wives, the much beloved sons, the skinny armed daughters, and in cities and towns, shining over the bomber plants, over schoolyards and shipyards, shining down to over France and Italy, over the darkness of Poland and Romania, over Auschwitz and Dachau, the furnaces stoked and blazing, in Hiroshima, where all the lights went out, the stars still shining like what we know of grace, like hope. This next poem is called Fixing Fence. I learned about pain and the, excuse me, I'm going to start again. I learned about love and the pain of mothers and fathers in 1955 on a hill farm, helping my father with my child's hands, helping in the way a child feels is help, carrying the hammer, singing staple, staple, singing beautiful sharp nail, clamoring this way and that so that the barbed wire must spring out, must jump like a grasshopper straight to my leg, and the blood in a little red stream run down to my dusty white socks. My father's face turned crooked, 
my father, who always laughed with that loud, gusty laugh, silent now, and his sun-tanned face drawn up tight as the wire that stung me and pale as mine as he carried me home to mother with her sickness voice, her it's all right voice, bringing the blue enamel pan of water, the sticky tape and white roll of gauze, and the dog brownie all whimper and creeping up close. Then the look from mother to dad, then dad to the floor, the indrawn breath, Oh, the pain of mothers and fathers, the guilt they take on. And since we're talking about memories, this poem is called The Way of Memory. There was a porch off the kitchen where my sister and I slept on hot summer nights. The screens rusty and covered with vines and the vines alive with spiders creeping along the way memory does when it goes walking on long spiky legs, legs slender and elegant but strong to keep the center, the careful body safe. This morning I bent to pick up a speck of lint from the floor and it turned into a photograph from 1958. There was a day bed on another screen porch. There was a cut on my leg and blood. There was my father with a scar on his forehead looking down. And then the picture picked itself up and scurried away into a crack in the floor. We take care with what we remember. We keep our feelers out. I want to ask the people in the audience, um, how many of you ever went to a country school? Okay, there's, there's some out there. Okay. Um, let me ask the people in the audience another question. How, how many of you ever participated in a spelling bee? Okay. All right. This poem is um, about studying for the spelling bee in a, in a country school in Nebraska in 1960. When, um, when there was a terrible, there had been a lot of snow that year and snow was everywhere. It's called Studying for the Spelling Bee. Excuse me, just one sec. February that year, the snow never stopped. John Glenn around the earth three times and below the world blue and white and brown and green, Mars and Jupiter beyond. But on this Nebraska prairie, at this Nebraska school, just the wind and white and cold. We went to the cloakroom, Jimmy McMillan and I, shut the door to the heat, the noise, put on our coats and hoods, stamped our feet, held our lists in mittened hands. Words steamed from our mouths to form in breathy clouds around us. Altitude, anchor, allegory, and through the window, the wind whipped the flag straight, its rope thrumming against the pole. Drifts boiled up into cold clouds the sun came out and diamonds skittered across the hills. How do you spell possibilities? How do you spell the future? There among coats and scarves and lunch pails, overshoes lined up against the wall. We knew. We learned to spell out wonder. We spelled out glory. We learned to spell out our dreams word by dazzling word. This poem is about um, shearing sheep. Um, on the farm where we grew up, we had all kinds of animals. We had cows, horses. I was never able to ride them. 
they threw me off. We had sheep, we had chickens, ducks, pigs, and I'm going to read a pig poem tonight, I promised. But this poem is uh, called Sheep Shearing. I have never known forgiveness or felt the value of my life the way I did those summers of 1958 and 1959, those hot Junes and Julys helping my father with the shearing. There in the cool of the sheep barn with the whirring of clippers, straw filtering down from the loft, dust motes, the ewes all bleat and dismay, buying one to the other, their full-throated alarms, stamping their feet, then gradually settling down beneath my father's hands, there on that rented farm, my sister and I watching, my sister and I learning. They gave up to buzz against skin, dirty wool peeling off and falling away to clean white and pink beneath. How wonderful we thought to be cool again and clean, to start out fresh on a hot June day, the green of life waiting and all that exorbitant blue. Have you ever had a dream in which, let's say you've lost a loved one, someone important to you, and that loved one came back in the dream. Uh, this is a dream I had. Uh, this poem came from a dream I had about my grandmother. It's called Shower, because in the, in the dream we read a bridal shower. Okay, think about the bridal showers you've been to. At the bridal shower, we sat on straight back chairs in a circle wore skirts and pantyhose and kept our knees together. <laughs> we balanced luncheon plates on our laps, ate nuts and mints, slurped down syrupy punch from tiny clear glass cups. Like cherry coke gone flat, you said of the punch, and the backs of our arms stuck to the chairs. Then, look, I said, it's Grandma Hadfield. And sure enough, there she was, her round little body perched on an upholstered chair, comfortable as a hen on a nest. She wore her blue old lady dress and brown old lady shoes over thick beige hose. It was Grandma, all right her cheeks brown like they'd grown those last few years and wrinkled softly like a ribbed sweater. Through her glasses, her blue eyes were warm, never mind that she'd been dead 18 years, never mind that the dirt on her grave had sunken in and been replaced and that granddad lay beside her now. It must have been hard coming back through all those clouds of glory, all that way, all those years, but you couldn't tell it to look at her, smiling even in the face of that awful, awful punch, as like the rest of us, she drank it down. <laughs> this next little grouping of poems, um, read a few of them. I, I guess I'm going to call them nature poems and I want to start with one that I think is quite appropriate tonight. Think of October about this same time seven years ago 1997. Kind of a winter storm we had then remember? Okay. I think a lot of uh, writers around town have some writing about the winter storm that happened in Lincoln and all the trees that were destroyed. This is mine. It's called in memory of trees after the late autumn storm, 1997. All night, a cracking like gunfire. First, the Bradford pears falling muffled in the snow. 
then the wild cherries, their boughs bearing pristine burdens of white, white, sighing to the ground, breaking. And oh, the river birch, like those on the fields of Manassas. All night, they say, the wounded, how they moaned. This next poem was inspired by something that I read in the newspaper, a newspaper article about uh, something that was happening up in Bassett, Nebraska. It seems that all the wild turkeys were taking over the town. And uh, <laughs> I thought that sounded pretty interesting. <laughs> and um, I was thinking about that, and this poem happened as a result. It's called News from the Sand Hills. It was in the Nebraska Poets Calendar some time back. News from the Sand Hills. In Bassett, they say, the wild turkeys have come to town, moving in off the plains like grizzled old farmers to retire in comfort. Their wives, too, plump and saucy with a bit of red flannel at their throats, their gray and brown shawls trailing to the ground. See them in the afternoons, ambling two by two to the backyard feeders, or gathered in knots by the feed store, their wise old heads bobbing back and forth, scratching, talking of the old times, the price of grain, the weather. <laughs> Sometimes here in Nebraska, we have some of those top 10 days. Not very often, but sometimes we have them. And five years ago, before our son got married, we had, I think, one of the, the top 100 days. The weather was just beautiful. And um, this poem came, out, came about as a result. It's called May Before the Wedding. The world is sparkling after last night's rain, and I go outside to worship. This is the life I want. Golden morning, the hummingbird a quick brown flash in purple iris. Look the way the raindrops glisten on the hostas their broad leaves like the curved, calm hands of aunts and uncles, people who love us without question. Sometimes the world sings out its astonishing beauty, and we unfold ourselves. We listen. We see. As I said, there were um, four girls growing up on those farms in Nance County. Um, uh, we lost one of our sisters three years ago, and um, this poem I wrote about when she had she was still living, um, but we knew she was sick. It's called Transplanting. All day I had been working at the work I love transplanting columbines and ferns, kneeling beside beds of a stilby and chrysanthemums, tucking them in tight. I planted impatiens in pots, violet vincas with silver lace, making combinations. When it was dark and I could no longer see, I went in. I had not thought about my sister dying all day except to wonder about the black-eyed Susans on her bare clay hill. In the evening, walking, what a delight the scent of honeysuckle, lilac, delicate hint of bridal veil, maple seeds helicoptering around me, their, ground, their lime green rotors gently clicking. 
That night, I dreamed we were back on the farm. Sun and blue sky, standing at the backyard clothesline. Our nightgowns hung by their slender shoulders. The breeze filling the skirts, the sleeves, puffing out the bodices, lifting them gently, white against the green grass below. Linda's was cotton and lace filled with fresh air. I unpinned it and placed it in her arms. I think probably two more from this grouping. Mary Oliver is a poet that I really admire a great deal. And in this poem, I've, I've used one of her lines. I've given her credit, but I've used one of her lines. And let me tell you what the line is first. Mary Oliver wrote, in the book of the earth, it is written, nothing can die. So this poem is called Believing. Believing. In the book of the earth, it is written, nothing can die. And I want to believe that the lily bulbs willing themselves out of the dark each April, trees leaving and unleaving, serene in their roots, their tight bark. I want to believe in the tree of my body, hair and fingernails, trunk and limbs, the parts that leaf out and bloom, then leaf and bloom again. And when the dormant time comes, the quiet time, there will still be the good leaves fallen, the transpired breath like sweet smoke rising. And the last poem I'm going to read from this section is called um, So Much. It's a winter poem, and it was written after taking a walk on a winter morning after a fresh snow. So much. There is so much to miss until the snow points it out. A tracery of vines on a gray board fence. All that have passed this way. Footprints of rabbit, junco, delicate brush of wingtips against the drift. How fast a heart must beat to fly, to live through cold. My breath this morning goes before me, and I see how visible is air warmed by blood. How substantial are words as plain as the bones of these elms or dark birds against the snow flying up. I would like to read what some of the poems that I call my Addie Finch poems. Let me tell you about them. <coughs> I think many of you in the audience here know uh, our, our state poet, Bill Clefcorn, and his book, Alvin Turner Farmer. It is a wonderful book. I read it, fell in love with it. It's the story of his grandfather, a Kansas farmer, as told and as envisioned by Bill through a series of poems in that book. And I asked him one time if he'd ever thought of writing a series of poems from Mrs. Turner's point of view, his grandmother's point of view. And he said to me, well, why don't you try doing something like that? And I was glad he said that because that was something I wanted to do very badly. Um, but um, what, so what I did is I, I wrote a series of poems that are from the point of view of a Nebraska farm wife living in the 1940s and the 1950s and are essentially the stories of my mother, my aunts, my grandmothers, my country school teacher, most of the women I knew when I was growing up. These were strong women. It was before feminism, but these women had something about them. They had good humor, they had 
an unbelievable strength, and I admired them so much and wanted to write about them. And so Addie Finch was born. <laughs> so I'm going to start with, with her marriage. It's called We Were Married in a Drought Year. We were married in a drought year. The corn withered and brown in the fields, rivers and dams running dry, the ground breaking into such wide cracks we feared for the neighborhood cats. Aunt Bertha said it was bad luck to start out at a time like that, but William had rented the bishop place and father watching how close we sat on the porch swing, all hands and eyes and wanting, said we better go ahead. <laughs> we would be wed at home, and that July, mother let the beans and tomatoes go without, watered the front yard green as any carpet. The gladiolas bloom just in time. How did she know how to do that? And we were married in an explosion of flowers, the preacher sweating in his collar, pink and white candles listing in the heat, our love hot as the metal on the black Ford basking in the sun, waiting to carry us away. And so they went to live on a redded farm. And uh, this poem is called, I Try Not to Forget. I try not to forget that it was the Pawnee who lived here before, walking along the creek banks, planting corn and squash and pumpkins. In the fields, their lodges at the crest of those hills Last spring, I found a small stone shining in the sun, and when I pulled it from the ground, it was warm at its heart, a small groove fashioned at one end where rawhide might be attached, where it might be stretched to attach a wooden handle. Ho, I whispered. I turned it over and over in my hands, running my fingers in the little groove, touching the blunt blade end where stone met earth. I could not get enough of touching, thinking of the ones who used it before, women, I was sure, thinking of the long winter coming and food enough and sickness. Now, Addie was a, was a town girl that married a, a farmer, and so she had to learn a few things. Um, this poem is called, Emma Teaches Me to Clean Chickens. <laughs> In real life, Emma was my grandma, and she taught my mother how to clean chickens. We bring in the bucket with the broilers, feathers plucked off, heads gone, their crooked yellow toes sticking up like old withered hands. Pouring alcohol into a jar lid, she lights a small blue flame to singe off the hairs. Like this, she says, and I see that it's a gentle thing, one of her hands grasping the feet, the other beneath the bloodied neck, gliding it in and out of the flames, a blessing. She picks up the knife. The next part is a little tricky. Her blade flashes around the tail, the breast, and she slides the insides out, pointing out the wonders of gravel-filled craw, lungs spongy with air, the green poison sack around the liver like a strange and wicked jewel. Cut that, she warns, and the meat's no good. Then from the nest of the body, I see the unborn eggs, a dozen at least, beige colored, shells soft and bouncy as jello, ranging from pea-sized to robin's egg 
to one so large that if not for us would have been laid tomorrow. It's the little eggs that bother me, she says, after all these years. She lifts the hen to the faucet, carefully rinses and rinses. Silly, isn't it? And since this was a rented farm, the landlord must come from time to time. This poem is called Landlord. The landlord has come, his black pickup truck in the driveway like a sleek Angus bull lifting its nose to the wind. He is not an unkind man, I suppose, but I resent his eyes looking over our fences, searching the hog lot for thistle. And just let him try to come into my kitchen with his muddy boots. William walks with him, his back straight as a rifle barrel. I stand at the kitchen sink, shelling peas, the green fruit falling into the bowl like little bullets. <laughs> he was really all right. <laughs> Time went on, um, and William and Addie had some children. This next poem is called Full, and I think it's appropriate for this time of year, too. Full. The cob house is full to the rafters, and in the cellar, potatoes, sweet onions, turnips bald-headed as new babies, pumpkins and squash like strange tropical fruit. Last night, the harvest moon rose, blood red and throbbing, and the girls are wild with leaves falling, the first bite of cold, their cheeks blazing like passion flowers. William, too, is full of himself, the corn harvested and prices up. As for me, I am smug in this bounty my little secret safe beneath my apron, growing. And I promised a pig poem. And here it is. And um, this poem was inspired by my sister Bonnie, who is here tonight. Bonnie is, um, um, when, she was a, when she was a girl, at least is quite an artist. I don't know, you probably still are, just are not developing that. But she drew a wonderful picture that inspired this poem. Okay, so just think pigs here, all right? And think of a hot summer day. It's called 98 Degrees. 98 degrees, and in the north pasture, the Angus are in the dam up to their necks in silty water. The hens take dust baths in the driveway, and in the hog lot, William hoses down the sows. Snout to tail, he says, is the right way to do it. And it must be done, for despite the saying, sweating like a hog, pigs don't sweat, that is. They lift their noses to the water, these five swine mamas, demurely accepting the cool droplets as if they were rose petals strewn before beauty queens. I imagined them at the swimsuit competition. <laughs> this is where the picture comes in. I imagined them at the swimsuit competition, these pink and lovely ladies, each in their seven-piece suits. <laughs> the regulation brief bottom, and above that, six little bra tops in a row <laughs> to cover them properly. <laughs> this next poem is called um, Rat. He sat on his gray haunches at the chicken feeder, sliding his jaws from side to side slobbering up the grain. My shadow shuddered across the floor and he tossed me a, and he swiveled his head to toss me a glance, then went on eating. 
His eyes were red and insolent, his scaly tail like a little whip. Saturday nights, when I was 16, a group of boy men stood at the pool hall door, smoking cigarettes, smirking. When my sister and I walked by, they slid their eyes over us, tossed their cigarette butts to the sidewalk, and slowly ground them out. I went to the house and got the 22, rolled the shell into the chamber. He was still there, eating. I shot him through the chest, through the floor, tossed him out with a shovel. When William came, I was kneeling a tin can lid on the floor to cover the hole. Rat, I said. <laughs> I once read an exercise where it encouraged the writers to think of a time when they were very busy and exhausted from what they were doing, like Robert Frost's apple picking. Uh, and this is, this, so this poem is about green beans. It's called Jazz Beans. All day it's been beans. I pick dish pans full, wash tubs. My back is permanently bent, I think. My hands reaching, turning aside the rough rounded leaves, searching for beams. In the kitchen, I wash away spider webs, clots of blossom husks, snip off the little pigtail ends and snap. And I'm thinking these are jazz beans and snap my fingers, keeping time to their music. The sink now full of beans, water boiling a drum roll on the stove, and the mason jars are white and hot, the air filling with the steam of dark, rank, cooked flesh of bean turning lime green, row upon row, making an entire bandstand of beans, jazzing it up on the counter. At last, I sit at the table to stretch my back. The jars stand at attention, their round gold hats set flat on their heads, glass faces shining, the lids sealing one by one with sharp musical pings. They are happy, they are jazzy, they are full of beans. <laughs> I think just two more poems for this for tonight. This next poem I I I got um, looking at some of the snapshots my mother had taken of we four girls as we were growing up, and I'm thinking of the backgrounds that she where she chose to take those pictures, and that's how this poem happened. It's called "Taking Snapshots of My Daughters." I line them up before the I line them up for photographs before the barn against haystacks posing with the placid-eyed cows and on Easter Sundays against the side of the house where the paint is peeling but the sun shines best Sometimes I try the trees of the shelter belt but the machinery lurks there the pickers and combines with steel teeth glinting. I take their pictures with brown hens clutched to their chest, or feeding baby lambs, or feeding baby lambs, the slender tails waggling in delight, tails soon to be bobbed or strangled by tight black bands until they fall to the ground. Lately, I've chosen the lilac bush, the April scent, so sweet, so brief, it brings a shine to the eyes. I cannot find a place where my heart does not jump to my throat. I swallow, press my finger on the shutter. Smile, I say. And let's finish with this one. It's called Saying Yes. 
The dishes are done and we two sit in the kitchen. Our comfortable chairs moved in next to the stove for winter, the table pushed to the wall. These are the times that we draw in close. William with his book, me with my needle pushing in and out, drawing the frayed edges of everything, it seems, back together. The old dog lies before the stove. William having asked if this cold night the dog could sleep inside. And of course, I say yes saying yes to dog hair and mud, yes to wet dog smell with our evening coffee. Haven't I always said yes? William comes to the door bearing some small creature, newborn lamb or baby pig, too sick, too cold, too small to stay outside. And I say yes, place them in a cardboard box behind the stove saying yes to tiny bleats when I stir the oatmeal, yes to sharp little hooves tap dancing the linoleum. Later, when he turns to me beneath the quilts, our world now, this small, warm cave, our children sleeping in the next room, I'll say it again, yes. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>